Okay, let's talk about these questions. Number one, nobody chose this question, so it's my question. The trouble with the protagonist is that he's without imagination. I agree. I do think that is his main problem, because if he had imagination, he might be able to imagine maybe something will go wrong. Instead, he keeps thinking about, I need to get there. It will be warm. It will be full of food and I will be able to live. But he doesn't imagine other possibilities. If he did imagine other possibilities, maybe he would decide not to go today and that he would go another day. And therefore, maybe he might have lived. So imagine the second part of this question. Why is imagination important? Not for the usual reasons. Usually when we think of imagination, we think of creativity, right? Chong yi, new artistic ideas. But here imagination is an important part of survival. Is there a better idea? Is there another option? And this is a good reminder for us. You may not become an artist. You may not become a writer. But when you solve problems in the future, you should always think whether it is the best way to do it, whether there is a faster, easier, more effective way, or maybe whether you should change your goal entirely. Always remember, even when you do uh, ordinary work, imagination is also very important. The idea of other possibilities. OK, question two, why is the dog in this story? Uh, this was very a quite popular question today. Everybody likes dogs. So as we remember in the story, the dog always says or thinks it's a bad idea. The man, uh, it's too cold. We shouldn't go. For example, page. Wait, what, what page is this? 17, right? So page 18. Bottom of page 18. At the man's heels trotted a dog, a big native husky. The proper wolf dog, gray coated and without any visible or temperamental difference from its brother, the wild wolf. So it looks like a wolf. It behaves like a wolf. The animal was depressed by the tremendous cold. It knew that it was no time for traveling. So it doesn't think, it doesn't estimate, it doesn't calculate, it knows. Its instinct told it a truer tale than was told to the man by the man's judgment. So this we'll get into this for question three, comparing instinct and judgment. Uh, and continuing, in reality, it was not merely colder than 50 below zero. It was colder than 60 below, than 70 below. It was 75 below zero. So the animal, the way that this paragraph is written is also very, very good. It first tells us that the animal, the dog knows it is too cold. And then it says, that its knowledge is better than the man's judgment. And then it tells us why the man's judgment is wrong. When it gives us numbers, a dog doesn't understand numbers. Numbers are only related to the man. So when it says in reality, it was actually much, much colder. It's talking about the man's judgment. But at the very beginning, it already told us that the dog knows this. Even if it doesn't know the numbers, it knows that it is too cold. So one function of the story, as some of you mentioned uh, when I went to talk to you, is the dog is a symbol of nature's danger. Like we know it's cold. We know that it's snow everywhere. There's ice everywhere. But if you have a character that continues to remind you it is too cold and it's dangerous, it makes it feel dangerous. 
when we read the story, we don't just know that it's dangerous. We feel that it's dangerous because a character is telling us with its actions we shouldn't go. Uh, some other answers I got include that um, like when the dog falls in water and then it comes up and it bites off the ice on its leg. It's also a symbol of nature telling, showing the man how he can help himself if he faces this kind of uh, problem. And so the man remembers the danger of ice and he decides to build a fire. This is also quite important. It's telling us that nature is not evil. Nature is not entirely against humans. Nature is neutral as its own leader. It is dangerous, but it, through the dog, it can also remind you how to save yourself. Uh, and then I had another answer, which is that um, it's a way for the story to give us an explanation of the man's motives and thinking. So in this story, we, we rarely see the man think, we rarely see the man feel. Instead, what we have is the man wants to do something, the dog doesn't want to, and the man tries to make the dog do something. And in this conflict between man and dog, we start to think why. Why is the dog against this idea? Why doesn't the dog want to do this? And through that conflict, we get to see how the man thinks, what the man cares about, and therefore where the man makes a mistake. Yeah, okay, questions about this one? Also, like we from the very beginning, we know the man is going to die. As soon as the dog says uh, it knew it was no time for traveling, we know the man's going to die. So in fact, what we really care about, first of all, how does the man die? But secondly, will the dog live? And thankfully, yes, the dog does live. In this story, the dog is aligned with nature, and so it can survive in nature. Next question, why does it keep emphasizing the dog's instinct? So one part of this answer is because the dog is a representative of nature, so it doesn't think for itself. It simply does what nature tells it to do. Uh, and then the other part of this answer is, as we just mentioned, it's a comparison between instinct and judgment. It, when the dog follows instinct, it does not have a choice. Nature tells it what to do, and it does it. And because it listens to nature, it lives. But the man has free will. It can make, uh, sorry, he can make judgments. And because he can make judgments, he can make wrong judgments. So the emphasis on instinct, first of all, can be to contrast this idea that the man has a choice and that he can make a wrong choice. It can also help to emphasize that the dog is not just behaving because it wants to do something or does not want to do something. All of its behavior is because of nature. So when the man goes against the dog, the word instinct reminds us he's not just going against the dog, he's going against all of nature. So of course he's going to die. Number four, one must not be too sure of things. So at this point in the story, number 21, sorry, page 21. Let's see if I can find this. Yeah. There it is. OK. So here. This is where the man finally realizes, wait, it's kind of cold. So here, line two, 
It certainly was cold, was his thought. That man from Sulphur Creek had spoken the truth when telling how cold it sometimes got in the country. And he had laughed at him at the time. That showed one must not be too sure of things. There was no mistake about it. It was cold. So at this point, the man knows that he has made a mistake. At first, he thought it can't be that cold, but here he realizes, wait, it really is very cold. But he doesn't stop. He doesn't go back. Why? Well, one, there are a few possible reasons. One reason could be, I mean, OK, all of these reasons are based on uh, an over-reliance on reason. He thinks that he can make a good choice. That's his big mistake. He thinks that he can think about it and he can calculate a good solution. Whereas we know the only good solution is to go back. So one possible reason that he can rationalize this choice, is because he has discovered he made a mistake. He has discovered that it's colder than he thought, which means it is, he is capable of discovering his own mistakes. So he doesn't have to be afraid of making mistakes. He can just think about it and solve each new problem. Where is the mistake in this thinking? If I noticed one mistake, I have the ability to notice mistakes, so I don't have to worry about not noticing something. The problem is, again, lack of imagination. What if you don't notice your next mistake? What if you get so cold your brain gets affected and you start to lose the ability to think clearly? The man does not think of this. Another possible reason for his rationalization is. Yes, it is colder than I thought, but I already got so far. Even though it's colder than I planned for, I was still able to successfully make it to this point. So even though it's colder, it can't be that bad, right? If I can make it here, I can make it to the end. The problem, of course, is that from the starting point to here is very different from from here to the end. First of all, the second half is longer. He has not yet gotten to the halfway point. Secondly, it's not just about the distance. It's about the experience of traveling. When he first starts, he has more energy. He has uh, higher spirits. But the second half will always be more tiring, will always have fewer resources, will always feel like it takes more out of you. It's like when you're jogging. Right? Let's say you want to jog for 10 kilometers. The first five kilometers will be much easier than the second five kilometers. Same thing here. He thinks maybe if I got here, I can get to the end, but he ignores the difference between these two halves. So as we can see, both, uh, both of his mistakes come from an over-reliance on his judgment. He depends too much on his ability to make decisions. And that's probably why, even though he realizes he made one mistake, he does not stop and turn around. And that's really tying up with the main theme of the story, right? Judgment versus instinct, free will versus nature, and here, reason versus instinct. Sometimes we as humans can depend too much on our reason and forget to imagine other possibilities. Finally, question number five. Uh, one group took this question. Why are the sentences so short and simple? Most of them. So this group said, well, 
this story is set in a very cold place, full of danger. The man is rushing to get somewhere. He doesn't have time to stop and think about stuff. This is why we seldom see him thinking, seldom see the story say the man felt this, the man felt that. So how do we feel what the man is feeling? The story puts us in his position. The man does not have time to stop and think. When we read the story full of these sentences, we also do not have the space to stop and linger on a long sentence. Things keep happening one thing after another. So because the story does not have a way to show us how the man thinks or feels, instead it creates a, an experience of reading that makes us feel like the man. He is rushing through danger, and we are also in a hurry when we read short sentence after short sentence. When we read, every time we hit a period, our brain stops and thinks back on what we just read. So if the sentence is longer, we have to take in more information before we stop and think about what we just read. When a sentence is shorter, we get more information in a shorter amount of time. So it feels like we're rushing, feels like there's lots of stuff to deal with. And I think that this answer makes a lot of sense. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about question six, and then I will introduce the midterm exam.
Question six. How can you tell that the story was written in the late 19th century? To answer this question, we should go look at the beginning of this handout introducing the late 19th century. So, do any of these things appear in the story? For example, For example, regional literature. This story is set in Alaska. There are many things about Alaska and Alaskan uh, culture, especially gold miners who go to Alaska, Alaska Taujinke, that you should know in order to really understand the background of this story. So like in the past, we read a story by Edgar Allan Poe about the detective. You didn't really need to know anything about Paris to understand that story. But to understand this story, you'd need to know about how cold Alaska is, how dangerous. You, you should probably understand that the people there help each other out by giving key information, such as it's too cold to travel. Um, let's see. The frontier declared closed in 1890. The idea of the frontier, 那个叫什么? Alaska is, even today, mostly an unsettled land because it is so cold. So when the man is traveling that distance out in nature, this is beyond the frontier, right? This is out beyond settled space. So when the frontier is declared closed in 1890, that means that Americans could no longer realistically imagine this kind of story. That there really is no more place that is completely outside of settled civilization. So this story is set in a particular time before Americans realized that there was no more so-called true, real nature to get lost in or to die in, unless you are very, very careless. Eighteen ninety-seven to eighteen ninety-eight, the Klondike Gold Rush. This was in Alaska. This is the reason why the man is in Alaska for gold. Uh, transatlantic radio is a good sign of technology. Why is the man able to go to Alaska in the first place? Why is society in Alaska able to survive? One reason is because of these long distance communication technologies, such as the radio, the telegraph, these kinds of things, and also the airplane. 1903, the Wright brothers achieved flight. You cannot travel Alaska without an airplane. Um, the seas are too cold and dangerous to sail, and Alaska is like pretty big. You should probably use an airplane. Then you have uh, below 1906, social Darwinism and naturalism. So in this story, we don't really have society, so we don't have to think too much about social Darwinism, but there is naturalism. Naturalism is the idea that nature may not be helpful to humans, and that if you go against nature, it's very easy for something to go wrong, nobody will save you, and you will have a tragic ending. That should sound pretty familiar, right? In fact, the story we read today is a classic representation of naturalism. Uh, in Chinese, we just call this zi Yeah, so those are some of the key ideas or events that are related to this week's story. And from these ideas and events, 
You can therefore tell that the story was written in the late 19th century. OK, do you have questions about these discussion questions? OK, the moment you've been waiting for. Let's talk about the midterm exam. OK, here are the rules. It is a one week take home online open book exam. It has a deadline. The deadline is. Uh, November 9 midnight. So next month, uh, next Thursday midnight. But it has no timer, which means once you start. It will not stop until the deadline. So it may have time. OK. So take as much time as you need before the deadline. Your answer must be an English essay with multiple unnumbered paragraphs. There are a number of key ideas here. English. Essay. Just uh, more. Multiple paragraphs, more than one paragraph. And the paragraphs should be unnumbered. We all sang bian hao. Next one. If you do not answer the question, li ti, or you answer the question in the wrong format, so you don't follow the second point, you will get 20 out of 40 points, which is 50%. Even if you have a great answer, if it's answering the wrong question, or if you make one of the mistakes in the second point, no matter how good your answer is, you will only get 50%. Next one, you can write your answer elsewhere and copy paste it into Moodle. So you don't have to keep Moodle open all the time. You can write it elsewhere and then copy paste. Next, you may submit as many answers as you want, and I will give you the highest grade. So I won't just look at your latest answer. I will look at your best answer. The exams are open book. You can use any resource except other people. You can look at the handout. You can look at your notes. You can look at whatever I put on Moodle. You can check a dictionary. You can go online. You can go to the library. You can ask your grandmother. You cannot wait. No, you can't ask your grandmother. Sorry, that's cheating. Uh, you cannot ask other people. You cannot talk about the exam with your classmates or your upperclassmen. But you can talk to me. I'm the one who wrote the question, so I can decide how much information is too much to give you. Right, so if you have any questions, feel free to write me an email or to corner me in, in the hallway or something. Um, about this point, uh, there's a story I love to tell. Maybe you've heard this story before. So in college, I, like you, had to take linguistics. And we all hated it, except for me, but that's a different story. Um, and the teacher knew that most of us hated it and that we thought it was too hard. So during the exam, it was in class. We had three hours. The teacher was sitting in the front and the teacher said, if you have any questions at all, feel free to ask me. So one of my classmates raised his hand and said, Professor, how do you do question one? And the professor said, come here, I'll show you. And so my classmate brought his exam to the front, sat down next to the professor, and the professor taught him how to do question one. So this story tells you, don't be afraid to ask questions because you don't know how much you will get. At most, I'll say I can't answer that. No harm. Next one. You must give specific evidence from at least four different points in the assigned text, not just four examples. 
So I will show you what you have to read for the midterm. When you answer, your answer must be supported by evidence from the text, specific evidence, not a summary, not a paraphrase, but actual details. And there, it, the details must come from at least four different parts of the text. So it's not enough to give four examples. It's not enough to use one example and explain it in four different ways. You must go to four different parts of the story and give at least one example from these four parts. When you give an example, you must tell me what is the page number of that evidence. Now, it's open book, so you can look for information elsewhere. If you do use information from other places, you must tell me what is the location of that information called? If it's online, what is the web address? Wangzi. If it's not online, what page number? If it's a video, what time? And you must put that information next to your evidence. You cannot say at the very end of your answer, I looked at these different sources. You have to tell me next to each piece of evidence where you found it. So you can't Next, if your evidence or information does not have a page number or does not have a source next to it, it will not be counted. So here's how this works. The, the maximum score is 40, right? You have to give evidence from at least four different parts of the text. So if you give good evidence from four different parts, you get 40. If you only give good evidence from three different parts, it's 36. Two parts, 32. One part, 28. If you try to give evidence, but it doesn't make sense, but you tried, I'll give you 24. Anything below that, if you don't give evidence, if you uh, like um, give the wrong, like if you give evidence, but no source, if you don't use English, if you don't follow the format, you get 20. Yes, you must use English. And then the last point, plagiarism will earn you a zero. This includes even the smallest things. In the past, some students thought, oh, the important part I wrote myself, but like the summary or the background I took from online, not okay. Even if you take the smallest, least important information from somewhere else, you must tell me what is your source. If you don't tell me your source and I discover your source, you get zero. Those are the rules of the exam. Do you have questions? I'll show you the question later. Yes. Yes. Now, um, if you're not familiar with the idea of plagiarism, oh, we don't know if you're not familiar with the idea of plagiarism, you can read the idea of plagiarism. What is plagiarism? Why is it important? And I know that many of you may not have had the experience of writing essay questions before. So here are some example answers to other essay questions, not this question, other questions. So the information will not apply, but the format, 那个格式, 那个引用方式, you can look at and think about how to use that kind of format. OK, so let me show you the question.
read the selection from Horace Callan's essay, Democracy versus the Melting Pot, on the main Moodle page. I'll show you that later. Aside from the author and year of publication, how can you tell that it was written in the late 19th century as defined in the handout? Uh, a few key pieces of information. Your answer cannot depend on the information about the author. It cannot depend on what year it was published. Because that's too easy, right? You have you have to look at the content. Be sure kind wins on Nayong. And it tells you it is from the late 19th century as defined in the handout. So the one we just looked at, the first page of this handout. So if you go online to look for information about the late 19th century, it has to match the handout or I will not count it. And your answer must mention the late 19th century. This is because in the past some students have said it is because blah, blah, blah. And, it, and the answer did not mention the specific period. So you do have to mention this essay was written in the late 19th century because. Uh, and then I have some hints for you. You can think about the essay's perspective, themes, argument, evidence, language, and historical background, Beijing. Now, if you go down, you will see this really, really big white box. You do not have to fill the box. This is to encourage you to say more. It is not to force you to fill the box. In fact, if you try to fill the box, the box will just keep growing. It's an infinite box. As So don't worry about the size, OK? Yes, you can give more than four, uh, four examples. You can give examples from more than four different uh, places. That's just the minimum. So do you have questions about the specific midterm question? I'll show you the, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the essay that I'm talking about, and you'll find evidence from there and from the handout, maybe from the recorded lectures, anywhere you can find things that you think will help support your answer. Okay, okay. Uh, just a reminder, this question can be answered without going online. It is possible to do this question depending only on the handout and your notes. Going online is just in case you get stuck. In fact, it's probably easier if you try to answer first, and then if you really get stuck, you try to look for more information. And if you decide to use ChatGPT, I hope you're very careful. Let me show you the essay. It is here, midterm exam text. This is the author introduction. You can use it or you cannot use it. It's your choice. The essay is from here to here. And it's not too long, right? Two and a half pages. Um, it's taken from the textbook, so it's a selection. It's not the whole essay, so it's from this essay. These three dots mean that the editor has cut some parts away. This is Bianji Sanchu Hao. So here you have another cut uh, by the editor. And another cut here. And then the essay ends here. 
OK, so you can go back and read this essay. Answer the midterm exam. Questions? Right, so this goes to next Thursday midnight. So next time we have we have class. You will still be doing the midterm exam, maybe. Anywhere you can go online. But next week we do have something to do in class. I'm going to introduce the next period. So and I'm going to pass out the new handout. So I think it's a good idea to try to finish the exam before next class. Um, but if you do have questions, you will see me next week. So you can ask me then. OK, uh, if you have no more questions about the exam, the exam will begin when the bell rings. Um, for now, you can read and think about the question. <laughs> 